next on Unsolved Mysteries. Dan Wilson began behaving erratically, then disappeared. Five days later, his car was found, but he wasn't. J.D. Method was smooth with the ladies, smooth enough to make off with nearly a half a million dollars of their money. Anastasia Romanov, daughter of the last Russian Tsar, was supposedly executed. Did she really die? And Glendine Butterfield raised her niece until they were forced apart. 20 years later, Glendine continues to search for her. Sound intriguing? You better believe it. These are unusual cases that you won't want to miss. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. One hundred years ago, in St. Petersburg, Russia, there lived a Grand Duchess named Anastasia. She was the blue-eyed youngest daughter of Tsar Nicholas II, the wealthiest man in the world. Anastasia and her three older sisters lived lives of glamour and privilege that were the envy of all. She grew into a rambunctious tomboy, a jokester, and a family clown. She was the rebel of the Imperial Romanov family. Then, on July 17, 1918, Anastasia's royal life came to a violent end. She was just 17 when her entire family was executed, along with their physician and three servants. Their burial site remained a state secret. As far as history was concerned, that was the end of Anastasia and her family. But it was not the end of her story. 19 months later, a young woman appeared on a bridge in Berlin, and the stage was set for one of the world's great mysteries. Nein, 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 stop! Eventually, the young woman would shock the world by claiming that she was none other than the Grand Duchess Anastasia. The debate over her identity has continued for decades. There is absolutely no question in my mind at all that the Grand Duchess Anastasia survived the assassination of the Romanovs in 1918, uh, made it to the West, and died in the United States as Anna Anderson. No question at all. The woman's claim became even more believable years later when Russian authorities discovered the Tsar's family grave in this remote field 600 miles east of Moscow. When the bodies were exhumed, two family members were missing, and one was most likely Anastasia. Is it possible? that Anastasia somehow escaped death and suddenly appeared on a bridge in Berlin. And it's a story that has captivated our imaginations for nearly a century, as well as igniting a firestorm of controversy. But now, recently discovered information may shed new light on this fascinating mystery. Anastasia's father, Nicholas II, was fated to be the last czar of Russia. In the beginning, his life was the envy of the world. An adoring wife, Alexandra, four beautiful daughters, the Grand Duchesses Olga, Tatiana, Marie, and Anastasia. And finally, a son, Alexei, heir to the throne. But while the Romanovs lived the good life, most of their subjects were starving. In World War I, hundreds of thousands of the Tsar's soldiers didn't have shoes, or rifles. More than a million men were killed or wounded. 
finally, the people rebelled. The monarchy eventually fell to the radical Bolshevik communists. The Romanovs were prisoners in their own palace until the Bolshevik rebels secretly moved them to a remote Siberian town. 11 months later, the entire family was executed, or so it was thought, until the mysterious young woman jumped from the bridge in Germany nearly two years later. Police committed the young woman to a mental institution just outside of Berlin. She gave no information about herself and was called Miss Unknown. It was months later when she finally said that her name was Anna Anderson. At her first physical examination, doctors discovered that the woman's body was covered with scars. She began to reveal her own personality very slowly. She was, in her mind, in hiding. And the best place to hide was this asylum where no one would come looking for her or suspect that she was who she was. The patient hid her identity well until Clara Puthart was admitted to the same ward a year later. I know you. I don't understand. What are you talking about? Oh, it is all right, my daughter. You know, it is such a miracle that you are alive. Clara Puthart was a devotee, as were so many people then, of the of royalty magazines. Yesterday. And she began to look at pictures of the Romanovs. Look at this picture. And she began to believe that Miss Unknown bore a striking, uncanny resemblance to the Grand Duchess Tatiana. And then it came to me. It is you. Miss Unknown didn't confirm or deny Clara's claim. But when word reached members of the Russian nobility exiled in Paris, they sent a representative, Madame Tolstoy, to meet the young woman. Don't be afraid, child. I wanted to meet you for myself. My God. She has eyes of Nicholas. Later, Tolstoy told people, when she saw those eyes in the context of the rest of the face, she knew she was looking at one of the daughters of the Tsar. Eventually, Anna Anderson told her nurses that she was actually Anastasia, the youngest Grand Duchess. In fact, she did resemble Anastasia in height and age. Several childhood scars and birthmarks also matched. The scars could have easily been the remnants of the Bolshevik bullets. Four years later, Anna was hospitalized for surgery. Shura Guillard, Anastasia's former nanny, came to meet Miss Unknown. Shura recognized the Grand Duchess both by her childhood scars and by a bone deformity on her right foot. Shura became even more convinced when Anna asked her to massage her forehead with cologne. It had been a favorite childhood ritual of Anastasia's, known only to the two of them. By 1927, Anna was living with a German duke and duchess. They believed her story, though most of the surviving Romanovs did not. Curious to see whether Anna was who she claimed to be, a close childhood friend of Anastasia's came to see for himself. His name was Gleb Botkin. Gleb was the youngest child of the Tsar's physician, Dr. Eugene Botkin. The doctor had been executed along with the Romanov family, but Gleb was able to escape from Russia. One of the childhood games that he and Anastasia had played together was that Gleb would draw or would paint a watercolor painting of animals dressed in human clothing and in human-like situations, give the picture to, to the young Anastasia, and she then would make up a story to explain the action in the picture. I would like to see the pictures. Oh, yes. As she leafed through them, 
She remembered the stories that she had made up years earlier to accompany the pictures. That they were safe because the cat was caught by a lion. It was the most significant recognition of Anastasia in her lifetime. And Gleb Botkin became, as she called him, her lifelong champion. Not to be afraid of the lion any. Coming up, Anna Anderson reveals details of what happened on the night the Romanov family was executed. The official story was that Anastasia Romanov, daughter of the Tsar of Russia, had been executed along with her entire family in 1918. Months later, a suicidal young woman was pulled from a canal in Berlin. She called herself Anna Anderson, but she claimed to actually be Anastasia. The story she told to a childhood friend of Anastasia's was very convincing. Anna described how she'd been horribly wounded during the execution. She was thrown on a truck with the dead bodies of her family and was hauled off to a secret burial site. At some point, the truck overheated. According to Anna, a soldier named Alexander Tchaikovsky was left to stand guard. He realized that Anastasia was not dead. He pulled her from the truck and carried her to safety. 20 years later, Gleb Botkin and Anna's lawyers went to court to prove that Anna Anderson was actually Anastasia and to claim a portion of the Romanov fortune. Anna Anna's attorneys based their arguments on the points of similarity between the Grand Duchess and Anna Anderson. Experts analyzed photographs of both women's ears. The match impressed even Anna's most bitter critics. Various scars and birthmarks also matched. Handwriting samples were analyzed and found to be identical. The case dragged on for decades. Anna became more and more eccentric and reclusive. She was almost totally uncooperative, both with her own attorneys and with the courts. Finally, in 1967, the German High Court issued a decision. There was not enough evidence to prove Anna's claim. The court did state, however, that the death of Grand Duchess Anastasia could not be considered a verifiable historic fact. Anna Anderson died in 1984, having never proven her claim. But that wasn't the end of the story. On July 12, 1991, the skeletons of the Romanov family were discovered in a mass grave near the site of their execution. At least most of them were found. In the grave, there were supposed to be 11 bodies, but only nine were there. Two were missing. For a whole year, we looked for the two missing skeletons but we could never find them. The Russians invited American forensic expert Dr. William Maples to examine the remains, hoping to determine which skeletons were missing. We looked at the remains, we photographed the remains, we measured the remains, uh, and for each of the nine skeletons, we determined age, sex, race. We determined that the Tsar uh, was most likely there, bodied seven as the Tsarina. We had the family physician, Dr. Botkin, and we had three of the daughters. But I don't believe any of the, the three daughters could be young enough to be Anastasia, who was 17 years, one month at the time of the shooting. Also missing were the remains of Alexei, the Tsar's only son. It was the absence of Anastasia's body, however, which once again fueled the theory that Anastasia had somehow managed to escape death by execution. Whether she could have survived that night, I seriously doubt it. As a forensic scientist looking at the objective evidence that we have, we don't have any evidence that anyone 
would have survived. The, the damage to the remains was, was pretty profound. Eight years later, DNA testing on the bones in the grave proved that five of the bodies were members of the Tsar's family. Comparison with the sample from Anna Anderson showed what many already believed. Anna Anderson was not a member of the Romanov family. This evidence put her claim to rest, but it still didn't explain why Anastasia's remains were missing from the grave. However, the official Bolshevik account offers some clues about what may have happened. The report states that on the night of the execution, the Tsar was ordered to wake up his family. He was told that they were in danger and had to be moved for their own protection. The girls were given half an hour to dress. They carefully laced on their corsets. A fortune in precious stones and gems had been sewn into the linings. The Romanovs, along with Gleb Botkin's father and three servants, were led into the cellar. They were told to pose for a family photograph that would prove to the world that they were still alive. And then abruptly, the Bolshevik officer in charge read the orders for execution. When they began shooting, the bullets bounce of Grand Duchess and return to them. They did not know that in corsets of Grand Duchess, the Tsarina hit their jewels, and jewels protected them. They decided that God protected them, and they a little, and they immediately began, became crazy, and disorder shooting began. The Bolsheviks loaded all the bodies onto a truck. However, on the way to the secret burial site, the truck got stuck in the mud and the officer in charge decided to dispose of the bodies on the spot. It was reported that in order to confuse anyone who might locate the grave, two of the bodies were burned and the charred remains buried separately. The other nine were buried together a few meters away. Update. Nearly two decades after the Romanov burial site was located, a second grave was found nearby. The remains buried there proved to be those of Alexei and Maria Romanov. The Tsar's family was now complete. It turns out that Anastasia's remains had been among those unearthed in 1991. But without the last two Romanov children, scientists hadn't been able to make a positive identification. And now we finally have proof. Anastasia's survival was, after all, a myth. Next, a devious Khan Wan preys on lonely women, taking first their hearts and then their money. Be careful who you fall in love with. That's the lesson learned by nearly two dozen women who got involved with a smooth-talking con man named J.D. Method. In a romantic little restaurant in Golden, Colorado. Peggy Peterson was getting to know J.D. Method after meeting him through a personal ad. Peggy was a single mother and businesswoman. Have you ever been in a helicopter? No, no. It's something I learned in Vietnam. JD was a very charming person and a nice person and a fun person and um, uh, someone with some professional credentials. He just knows the answers to just about everything. He's intelligent and you just enjoy his company. He could talk about any subject. He knows about a little bit of everything. In essence, he would interview these women. He would talk to them. He would find out 
uh, what they were about, their idiosyncrasies, what they liked, what they didn't like, what their style of life was. You know, Peg, I was thinking, you really ought to have a few more credit cards. Whoa, no, One of the things that we found in our investigation oh, was the method's uh, ability to get his victims to extend their credit through the use of credit cards. And, and not just one, but get a lot of credit cards and even get a lot of the same kind of credit cards. You could get $15,000 just like that. His actual goal, of course, was for me to have so much credit that he could ultimately draw cash against himself or get me to, you know, with his various uh, catastrophes that he had in his life. You know, as long as I had all these cash advances that I could draw, well, that was more money that he could borrow. Peg, I'd like you to meet Rick. Well, hi, Rick. Hi, Peggy. Nice Method worked slowly until his victims trusted him completely. I noticed that nice-looking Camaro over there. What's the story on that one? Oh, J.D., you'll love that. $1,500, private owner. Hold it down for you for $500 down. Oh, is that right? Yeah. See, Peg, there you go. If I had $500 cash, I could buy that car today, sell it tomorrow for $1,000 profit, have 1000 bucks in my pocket. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Hey, what else you got there? I got a nice, clean Z over Hey, honey, there. I'm going to go $3,000. All right. Red in here. Method was so good that the women would offer to invest without even being asked. I had already survived him doing several car deals over the weeks that we had been dating. So I wrote him out a check for $500. Uh, excuse me. I'm not going to take your money. <laughs> now, it, and it's not a matter of the money. It's playing the game. He tore the check up, and he said, I wouldn't take money from you. And uh, I said, so, you know, I mean, check was torn in half. I didn't think anything about it. The very next day. Listen, honey, I need your help this afternoon. Method told Peggy that his uncle was seriously ill and needed immediate surgery. He explained that his money was tied up with investors and that he was terribly embarrassed to ask her for a loan. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll have it ready for you. Well, you know, what could I do? I mean, I'd already, I've already committed myself that I could let him have $500. And, you know, what can I do? I can't say, well, yesterday I had $500 to loan you, today I don't. So they found the truck? Yeah, they found Method the found another victim. We'll call her Amelia. At the time, Amelia's son was selling his car so he could buy a pickup truck. Method told Amelia he'd like to help and that he could sell the car and for an additional $4,000 could make a great buy on a new pickup. You got the title? We do. It's all signed, taken care of. Okay. Okay, you both signed it over to me. That's good. And, uh... 4,000 cash? Got it. That's all we need. So I told him I had some questions about the car and was feeling anxious about the whole situation since I didn't know him very well. He was saying to me, you know, how could I possibly doubt him? Because at some point in the conversation, you know, I had said something to the effect that for all I knew, he could be a con artist. And his immediate response was, Amelia, you could be a con artist for all I know. And that's how it got started. First it was a little amount, and then it would get bigger, and then bigger and bigger. And eventually, it would get into the uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Linda, I need your help on this deal now. Method worked on Linda Weaver for two months, then hit her up for big money. So what I'm asking for is a small loan, $15,000 to get this I don't have $15,000. Do it for you and me. Okay. Good girl. It happened so fast that I didn't realize what was coming across until afterwards I'm going, oh my God, what is going on? You know, he was so good. He hit and ran, and he's doing it to all his victims. She is somebody. Three months after he met Peggy Peterson, Method ran the same scam on her. Listen, dear, I need about 9,600 bucks. Oh, man, that's a lot of money, J.D. But that's chili beans compared to what my assets are. His rationale was always that, well, I'm going to pay you back next week. I'll have my money next week. I'll pay you right back. Mm -hmm. That night, I, you know, I was just sleeping soundly. I was sleeping like a brick. And at 2.30 in the morning, I just sat bolt upright in bed. It, like God had slapped me up the side of the head with a two-by-four and realized what had happened to me. I knew Jerry for 11 months. During that period of time, he uh, 
in one way or another extorted over $70,000. In Amelia's case, Meth had also waited three months before setting up the big score. I don't know about taking the equity out of my home. Well, Amelia, it would only be a short term. Now, if it'd make you feel more comfortable, I've got a promissory note. A promissory note? Yes, it's a legally binding contract that ensures you that I'll pay you back the oh. exact sum. But Jerry, I know. The problem with the promissory notes was that J.D. Method would fill out the promissory note backwards. He would make himself the payee, and he would make the victim the maker. So that when you read the promissory note, it said that she owed him $30,000, $40,000, whatever the amount that was involved with that particular victim. As Mr. Method was starting a relationship, he would either be in the middle or the end of another relationship. And as the previous relationship began to end, he was in the process of beginning to get money from the new relationship. I don't believe J.D. Method knows the difference between truth and reality anymore. I think that he has built his life on s lies for so long that he doesn't even know the truth anymore. I think he, he probably believes all of the glop that he shovels off on women. Update. Two years after he conned Peggy Peterson, J.D. Method was apprehended in Beaverton, Oregon. Local police got a tip from a woman who claimed that she had lost $2,000 to a man she'd met through a personal ad in the newspaper. Police staked out the man's home and arrested him when he returned. He would soon be revealed as J.D. Method. Inside the house, authorities found papers and documents used by Method to pull off his scams. Jerome David Method was convicted on three counts of theft and sentenced to 16 years in prison. He served his time and has been released. Next, the bizarre story of a soft-spoken man who suddenly lost it at work and mysteriously vanished the same day. In Spokane, Washington, at the ASC Machine Tool Company, 35-year-old Dan Wilson was a reliable worker. Though recently divorced, he remained devoted to his two children and his Bible study. Then one day, Dan seemed to snap. Hey, Dan, when's this one gonna be done? What's the problem, Jerry? Oh, no problem, just knead it over on the other line whenever you're done with it. Every time I try to get my work done, you come down here and give me a hard time about it. Dan's foreman was shocked by the outburst he and the plant manager were concerned, and they told Dan to take some time off and come back whenever he felt ready. But Dan never returned. Five days later, on a remote highway 700 miles from Spokane, Sheriff Tony Harbaugh spotted a car abandoned on the side of the road. When the car was found, the doors were unlocked. In fact, one of the doors was ajar. Check for keys in it, Mark. The keys were not in the vehicle when it was found. There were a few miscellaneous items, one of which was a Bible laying on the front seat. You've got a Bible on this side. Daniel Wilson inscribed in the front of it. Sheriff Harbaugh traced the car to Dan Wilson. We conducted both ground and aerial searches. It's my belief that if Daniel Wilson was in the area, in, in any of the area that we covered, we should have found him at that time. There was no reason for Dan's car being abandoned in the middle of the Montana prairie. His mother, Darlene, along with two of his cousins, went to Miles City to talk to the sheriff and get some answers. We checked the car. The sheriff told us that the car looked like it had just been parked there and that someone had walked away from it. They had looked under the hood and there was nothing wrong there. And there was a third of a tank of gas. Search the ground around the area here. I couldn't here. visualize in my mind uh, that he would just walk away from the car and just take off. 
It certainly was not an area where you would expect a person would stop and take a walk. Dan's family thought he might have been heading to Colorado to visit other relatives. He had made the trip from Spokane to their home in Longmont many times before. Dan normally followed Interstate 90 through Billings, Montana to Colorado. But this time he headed east instead and drove 150 miles into the sparsely populated area where his car was found. I just want you to leave me alone so I can get my work done, all right? How had Dan strayed so far off course on such a familiar route? His mother suspects foul play. I know that he did pick up hitchhikers. If he felt he could give somebody a ride, he would. I'm concerned that maybe he was not the person that parked the car in Montana, that it could have been somebody else. Dan's mother and cousins were determined to unravel the mystery. They went back to Spokane, where they found his home a complete wreck. He's even left the light on. I'll go look in the bedroom. His luggage, his clothes, and an uncashed paycheck were all still in the house. The family left Spokane more puzzled than ever. Darlene and her niece Glenda drove Dan's car on their trip home and something odd happened. They both developed sore throats and a painful burning sensation in their eyes. My eyes have been hurting too. Back at home, they had the car inspected. Folks, what we have here is a faulty muffler on the car. It could be allowing exhaust gases to enter into the interior of the car. I would say the car would be unsafe to drive. It appeared that a carbon monoxide leak in the muffler might have caused Darlene and Glenda's physical symptoms. Dan had been driving that same car every day for over a year. Perhaps he inhaled carbon monoxide whenever he drove. Chronic exposure to carbon monoxide can cause fatigue, can cause definite changes in personality. Confusion can cause permanent loss of function of the brain, intellectual ability, memory, as well as severe personality changes resembling psychosis. I feel it's not impossible that Dan made a decision to disappear and start a new life. He was under a great deal of pressure. He had not had a happy life since coming to Spokane. But I feel the possibilities are small due to the fact he was so devoted to his children and he felt the children needed him so badly. I feel that whatever has happened is something beyond his control. He could be most anywhere and we wouldn't be able to locate him or he wouldn't be able to locate us. Update. Nine years after Dan Wilson disappeared, authorities found his remains just five miles from where his car was abandoned. It was determined that he had died of exposure. No foul play is suspected. Why Dan picked that place to park and whether he was alone remains a mystery. Next, a 22-year search for a lost child ends with a touching reunion. Thanks to one of our viewers. Santa Maria, California. Bob! Glendine Butterfield was about to meet the newest addition to her family, her niece, Kellyanne. So how is your flight? Glendine's brother, Bob, was in the army and was being shipped to Germany. He and Kellyanne's mother had separated, and neither one could care for the baby. The Army planned to put Kellyanne in an orphanage, but Aunt Glendine wouldn't hear of it. So she went up the chain of command, straight to the office of the president. 
About two days later, the base commander at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, called me and said that if anybody would go that length to keep a kid out of an orphanage, that the Army would give my brother a grant and leave to bring her to me. Once Bob gave custody of Kellyanne to his sister, he seemed to lose all interest in her. Glendine was on her own. I didn't hear from him for a long time. I mean, a real long time. I think it was probably maybe three years, we'll say three years. And he just kind of like disappeared, you know? Kellyanne spent those years happily growing up with Glendine and her two daughters. We just thought of her as a little sister, because we got her, she was a baby, she was real tiny, so. She was no different than my sister Vicky, except for more fun. <laughs> She liked her horse, she liked riding horses, she liked, she just did everything that anybody's normal kid did them no different than them, except they were a little older. You know, I mean, she just, <laughs> happy, go lucky. Then, out of the blue, Bob suddenly reappeared unannounced and moved in with Glendine. He still showed little interest in being a father, but things changed quickly when a young woman named Kitty moved into the same apartment building. Less than a week later, Bob moved in with Kitty. And then, without saying a word to Glendine, he decided to take Kellyanne with him. Hey, Kellyanne. They moved her out after Bob going knowing this woman for a day or two. And I just went into hysterics over it. I mean, you know, this is my kid. Kelly! With the help of the police, Glendine got Kellyanne back, but the battle over the child was just beginning. Within a few months, Glendine says Kellyanne changed. She became an unhappy, confused little girl. I just don't understand. Kitty wants me to call her mommy, and Uncle Bob wants me to call him daddy. The situation became even worse when Bob sued Glendine for custody. And I've just had a nice long chat with um, Kellyanne in my chamber. She's a very bright, intelligent child. She really wants to stay with Glendine. She's very happy where she is. So I've never been so happy. I find for the respondent. The judge said that Kitty and Bob could have visitation rights. Six months, we will review the situation. They would see her when they weren't supposed to. They would talk to her, tell her things. Uh, it just kept her in a world of little confusion, you know what I mean? You think of a little girl, five years old, or four and a half, five years old, in a state of confusion. She doesn't even know what it's like to have a father. No, but she knows what it's like to have a mother and to have sisters and have a whole life. You, you are not the mom, and I am her real father, and you know that! You are not taking her yes, father it got to the point that I was so concerned about her mental well-being, you know, for when she got older and everything, that I decided I needed to keep her away from my brother Bob and Kitty. You want to start a war, you just started one. Let's go, Kitty. As much as she wanted to keep Kellyanne, Glendine felt that it was impossible. She could think of only one other option, Kellyanne's birth mother, Marion. Marion was in the Air Force. She had remarried and had two sons. Glendine believed Marion could provide the stable environment that Kellyanne needed. So because of that, you want to give up custody to this lady? No, it's not that I want to. But I do think it'd be best for Kellyanne. The judge Marianne agreed to the plan. Soon after, Glendine kissed Kellyanne goodbye and left her with her new family. I'm gonna miss you so much. I love you. I don't want you to go. I don't want her to go. I couldn't believe I lost my child. I mean, this was my child. And I couldn't believe that I lost her, that I didn't have her anymore. Hey, sisters and I sure miss you. The last time Glendine spoke to Kellyanne, she was just six years old. She told me she missed me and that she loved me, and I told her I loved her. And, you know, it was like a kind of not a real long conversation, but just, you know, I felt wonderful when I talked to her. Yeah. 
When Glendine called again, the line was disconnected. That started her on a desperate search that after 22 years still had not turned up a single clue. During that time, Glendine and her brother Bob patched up their differences. They even worked together to try to find Kellyanne until Bob's death in a farming accident. Glendine continued the search alone. There hasn't been one day went by since I gave her up that I haven't thought of her a dozen times and wondered, is she okay? Does she need anything? Is she happy? Did I do the right thing? Did I do the wrong thing? I just wish I knew. Update. Within minutes of our broadcast, a viewer called to let us know that Kellyanne was married and the mother of two young children. Kellyanne and Glendine spoke on the phone that very evening and made plans to get together. The reunion took Glendine to Anchorage, Alaska, 2,000 miles to the north. Kellyanne was stationed at Fort Richardson, where she was the specialist E-4 in the United States Army. It feels wonderful. I just can't believe I found her. I don't believe it. <laughs> All these years, I've pitched her like she's still six and a half years old. I never could imagine her growing up. You should. <laughs> Hearing from her again, has, it has filled gaps in my life that I have felt like, you know, there's part of my life missing. You know, where is it, you know? And I always feel like I'm looking for something, but you know, to know that she's cared about me and loved me all these years is a very good feeling. You know, we drove truck. To help yeah. fill the gaps, Glendine brought along dozens of family it's photographs. <laughs> I've never been happier in my life. I got all of my kids now. I know where they're all at. All my grandkids. I don't need nothing else in life now. 